This Rock Talk podcast recording is an interview and opinion product that is the property of rocksubculture.com, all rights reserved. Rocksubculture.com is not responsible for any statements or opinions expressed by the guests of this program. Welcome to Rock Talk, the official podcast for rocksubculture.com. Each podcast features interviews with special guests to discuss all aspects of popular music. Rocksubculture.com travels the globe to experience, review and archive live concert events. Interview those involved in producing and performing a variety of genres of popular rock music as well as find and learn about related studio and stage use artifacts and memorabilia. Now, let's join our host, Jason DeBoard. Welcome to the program. I'd like to um, thank my guest for coming on. It's Paul Robb from Information Society. Welcome. <laughs> my pleasure. So um, I have some questions for you today. It's it's an honor for me to talk to you. I'm a huge, huge fan of uh, oh, the band, you. and it's a little bit surreal for me. But um, let's start by talking about the concert tomorrow night at King King. Can you tell us a little bit about that show? This was a show that came up um, sort of at the last minute. We were preparing and are right now in rehearsals for uh, doing a series of dates in South America. Uh-huh. And uh, we didn't really have any intention of doing any shows in the States for, for a variety of reasons, but um, we are rehearsing in L.A., uh, which is where I live, and uh, the, the opportunity to do this show came up, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice place, and um, uh, you know, it's, it gives us an opportunity to sort of polish the show, and it gives an opportunity for all our friends and family to kind of... Uh, hang out and, and see a show which none of them have done for years and years and years and years. Oh, cool! So it's going to be kind of a uh, it's going to be like uh, playing records in your in your dad's rec room, I think. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, I'm I'm in Northern California, so I'm coming down for it. So I'm really looking forward to. Uh, oh, there's a whole caravan out. of people coming down from NoCal. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um. So you guys are going to do some um, gigs in Brazil this month, right? That's correct, yeah. So what do you attribute kind of, I know you're, you're really popular um, in a lot of other countries like, you know, Brazil, Spain, South America, Mexico, Scandinavia. Do you have any idea of kind of how that came about? No, it's funny because I just got done not answering that question <laughs> <laughs> for a newspaper uh, writer in Brazil <laughs> because that's always the first question they answer or they ask us is, uh-huh. um, you know, to what do you attribute your your you know big fan your you know your big success in this country or that country? And and the answer is I we have no clue. Never have. I mean, I have a, a few little pet theories that are kind of more <laughs> nerdy than, than <laughs> entertaining. But uh-huh. uh, and you know, in a nutshell, I I theorized once. I don't know if I still believe this, but that you know one of our formulas you know, back in the day for writing was that we would take urban beats and then we would sort of bolt on very romantic or even new romantic, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Song, yeah. Um, songs onto the top of those urban beats. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, it's possible that those, those romantic Latin chords that, that are at the heart of so many of our, um, hits might be one of the reasons, at least for the, you know, for the South America, Spain connection. Right. In terms of Japan and, and you know, these other outlier markets, Scandinavia, who, who knows? Yeah. You know, whereas in England, you know, places, the UK, places like that, they're, they're more like, yeah, we don't, we, we have Erasure and Depeche Mode, we don't really need you people. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, you take it where you can get it. Yeah, interesting. So, you know, some people might not know, but you've gone on, you know, after um, the band broke up 
in the early 90s, you went on to become a really successful um, um, in the film industry and television and commercial scoring, various things. Um, do you feel like you've got some, maybe you're sort of prescient and in going into this electronic music? Because I know back in the 80s, it wasn't as respected. And, and now, you know, it's sort of um, seen in a totally different light. I mean, kind of what are your thoughts on that? Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'd like to say that we were prescient and that we we had a master plan all along and uh, <laughs> and everything like that. But really, we just uh, were attracted to certain kinds of music, mostly because we were contrarian. Mm-hmm. We didn't want to play, uh, you know, garage punk music. Um, although we did feel like we came from a punk aesthetic, right? But we just used synthesizers instead of guitars, right? Right. Um, but honestly, it was that was just the kind of music that we were attracted to ourselves in our own lives. It was the soundtrack to our uh, lives, and so that was, of course, the kind of music that we aspired to create. You know, when we wanted to make music, right? Uh, and it's really as simple as that. Yeah. Um, there was no grand plan. There was no. You know, we used to make a lot of noise about, you know synthesizers are the future of music and, you know, rock is dead and, and things like that. But, you know, we weren't that serious about it. It was more just to rile the feathers of the music scene in Minneapolis more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. And kind of along... That's the long answer. The short answer is that's the music we love. Yeah. And kind of along those lines also, you know, you guys kind of celebrate, you know, earlier in your music is kind of a geek culture celebration. And, you know, back in those days, it wasn't cool to be a geek, but now it's like, you know, the big bang theory is like the number one comedy on television. I know. There's comic con and it's rings true too. Yeah. um, Yeah. No, you're, 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 you're correct. And I think we were, I'd like to take credit for for creating part of that, that cultural meme. Um, But it's probably more likely to say that we were just sort of riding a cultural wave at the at the beginning of that process mm-hmm. of celebrating the geek and celebrating the nerdy and, and celebrating the, 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 the technical and and uh, you know twitchy little aspects of things mm-hmm. um, and we were just maybe earlier on the scene than than uh, popular culture but um, you know it, there's also it's there's a lot of things when I look back and that we were way into that we were way obsessed with that seems very very silly and unbelievably <laughs> not prescient <laughs> now <laughs> so yeah. uh, you know it, it cuts both ways yeah yeah so back in the 80s what kind of music were you listening to as you guys were getting started that kind of inspired you musically well it was a very diverse uh, it was a very diverse list of, of groups and and I think that we we were very privileged to grow up at the you know right at the, the zenith of new wave, mm-hmm. um, which was you know probably the most you know creative explosion of of musical expression that I don't even know since when maybe since ever yeah um, and so you know for us we were listening to things as diverse as you know the B fifty twos and here is uh, Gary Newman, Devo, um, Soul Sonic Force, Fat, you know, all the English electronic music, right. Mute Records and Yellow, The Residents, all the No Wave bands out of New York. We idolized them like DNA and Lydia Lunch and, you mm-hmm. know, basically anything that wasn't on the radio was, was great right. to us. Right. And the weirder it was, the better we <laughs> liked it. Yeah. And if you listen to our early music, it was extremely strange. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't until later that we kind of learned the craft of um, pop songwriting and then began to practice that craft. Yeah. So when you came up with um, the song, What's On Your Mind, did you <clears throat> did you know it was going to be a hit? And did you know it was going to be that big of a hit? At, you know, as no, you not at all. It? As a matter of fact, when I first wrote What's On Your Mind, it was about a 12-minute uh instrumental jam <laughs> and as most of our music was at that stage uh-huh. and it was a process of wrangling that jam into a um into a song with a hook came very very slowly as a matter of fact 
the, the, the chorus hook of that song is, was actually the second chorus that I had written for the song. Hmm. Um, there was a different chorus that was originally on there at first, which people can find if they search hard enough on the internet. Um, so it was a, it was a, you know, a crafted thing that we, it took me a long time to figure out how to write pop songs. Yeah. So and was that it, song was, was no exception. Yeah. So was it, what was it like for you to have that just immediate success where you're all over MTV and, you know, on the radio and cause well, you, you guys have been together for a while. What seems like immediate success to, to the audience actually was the culmination of many years of, of hard work and, right. and not, not having success. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I will admit that we became very popular very quickly and, um, you know, I can say we dodged most of the major demons that like everyone else or mm-hmm. a lot of other people that get very popular very fast. None right. of us became druggies or alcoholics or self destructive in any other way or right. any of those things. But, you know, we we had our ups and downs. It was like riding a roller coaster and um hanging on was really the first priority. Mm-hmm. And and trying to drive the thing was the second priority. Right. So um, there wasn't much planning going on, but bottom line is it was a great experience. Yeah. Right. It was, you know, and it was a time that I, I don't know that that's going to happen again, just because of the way media works these days. It's very fragmented. Um, and it's hard for anyone to break through the, the substrate of chatter and noise that just exists at all times now. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's so many channels now with, youtube and everything's electronic download music and that's the thing is how do people break out and then also even big artists how do they maintain relevancy and keep on people's radar yeah i do not envy you know an up-and-coming artist of today yeah so kind of what is your overall summary view of of how the music industry's changed predominantly due to just technology um, yeah, well, you know, is there a music industry anymore? I yeah. don't, I don't know. Um, there's a media industry, mm-hmm. you know, you can get a record deal if you get a TV show first, mm-hmm. but other than that, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And, but I will say I'm, I'm not a huge, uh, I'm not uncritical of the flattening of the media landscape or of the landscape of work in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great because anybody can put their get their song up on iTunes now, but, you know, as <laughs> as the promotions guy at Warner Brothers used to say in the 80s, that and a quarter will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, access to distribution channels used to seem like holy grail, but now people realize it doesn't matter at all. What yeah. matters is, is you know, what the, the new $10 buzzword of this decade, curatorial aspects of things. Mm-hmm. That's why DJs are the new superstars, because not because they really do anything as performers, but because they are the curatorial gatekeepers for what people think is cool and what isn't. And that role used to be filled by other people, and it still is filled by a variety of people. But, um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of of my discovery of music when I was a young person that's, that's just not available to young people today. Mm-hmm. You know, browsing in a record store and, and just um, discovering things, or... You know, I mean, college radio still exists to a certain extent, but it's not like it once was. Right. We have a great college radio station out here called KXLU, which is just still fabulous. And you can hear the weirdest, oddest things on that station that you would never hear anywhere else. But other than that, uh, you know, it's hard for people to break out of their micro bubbles. Yeah. And do you think kind of the notion of albums is sort of breaking down as well? Like everything's really single driven and... Yes, I do. I feel I feel that that's exactly true. I feel we're back to the the very beginning of recorded music, where there was uh, again because of technological limitations, there were no albums. There were only singles. Because right. Records couldn't hold more than ten minutes. Of, you know, five minutes per side. Right. Um, which I don't know if that's good or bad. I have nostalgia for albums because I grew up with albums and sequencing and the whole experience of sitting down to listen to music while doing nothing else was very seminal in my life but obviously you can't mourn what what you know 
what's gone. Right. Um, I remember when 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 MTV first uh, opened up, or you know, first started broadcasting. I was kind of bummed out because I didn't <laughs> want to see pictures uh, along with the music because yeah. I wanted I I want I you know I wanted to make my own pictures in my mind right. while I listened to music. Right. And then I would see these videos of my favorite songs, and I was kind of like, oh, that's that's not what I was thinking. That's <laughs> depressing, or whatever the case may be. Right. <laughs> And now I don't think people can imagine music without pictures attached to it. Yeah. Really. Well, I think I think a lot of young people today they they get their music from YouTube because it's free, and then they get the the video along with it. So it's right. just a different We're experience. Not, I mean, my favorite YouTube phenomenon is when people just take a video of of the record going around. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> so um i don't want to take up too much of your time today but I had one last question um what is it like performing and recording as part of information society today when you've got um i assume most of your income is coming from you know your work in film and television and all that so mm-hmm. does that give you more of a sense of freedom to really kind of do what you want to do it does to a certain extent i mean uh, on the other hand we're we are a little bit constricted by our own legacy mm-hmm. um as all groups are, I guess, that have a history. But, you know, as I was, as Kurt and I were just discussing with each other the other day, it's the fact that we're not dependent on the band as our primary career and mm-hmm. income source and also sort of identity. Right. Takes a lot of the pressure off. So yeah. we bicker a lot less because <laughs> it's not so important <laughs> and it's not, you know, every little thing is quite so critical. Right, right. Um, but, um, you know, other than that, it's, we're still the same people. We're still the same band. And um, I think that the, the underlying dynamics of who we are and what we do together are probably not ever going to change. Right. Cool. Well, well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys play tomorrow night. It'll be exciting. Well, so <laughs> Thanks very much. It was, it was my pleasure to talk with you. And uh, uh, I hope, I'm sure I'll bump into you tomorrow night. All right. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay, cool. Thank you for listening to our program, Rock Talk. For the latest gig archives, articles and features about popular music and concert events around the world, please visit us online at www.rocksubculture.com.